blurring the lines with the world, what we've been talking about. We've been talking about how God calls us to be a holy people and he calls us to come out and to be separate. And that separate word there in the Greek literally means to draw a line. This is the boundary and I will not go over or past this. And we're living in an age where everybody wants to erase that line. People are calling for, you know, it's no longer us and them. It's no longer the church and the world. We've got to blend together and be one. Totally contrary to God's call to holiness. And if we allow that to happen as the church, if we allow these lines to blur and to be erased, God's presence will leave us as the church. He said, come out from among them and be separate, and then I will receive you. Then I can walk among you and abide in your midst. And so there's a real, uh, real tension there between loving the sinner, accepting the sinner, and at the same time, protecting the holiness of God's church and the holiness of his presence. And so we talked through a couple of these things. We talked about the discipleship versus social activism. Uh, the, so many people confuse the church that we are to be uh, social activists and we are to make this world a better place for people to live. Nothing could be further from the truth. I mean, we're compassionate, we're loving, we help people that are in need. We help people in need all the time. But we're smart enough to realize we're not going to change the trajectory of this world system and we understand that this world is king, being kept in store for judgment. There is only one way that this earth is going to conclude and end. And we're rapidly approaching that point. Secondly, we talked about holiness versus grace. Or holiness versus inclusivity. You know, we, uh, we're living in times when they want to erase all racism. And there's no distinction and I, I guess they think they're coming up with nothing new, but it was the Apostle Paul who said, in Christ Jesus, there's neither Greek nor Jew, male or female. I mean, in Christ, there's always been unity. In Christ, there's never been racism. In Christ, there's never been prejudice. But out in the world, that's basically one of the primary dynamics driving the world system is hatred for people that are different from you. And so they're trying to correct that and erase that, and they, they don't understand. They will never eliminate racism until Jesus comes into their heart and they're supernaturally born again and changed into another person. And so there's this constant tension of we've got to include everybody and accept everybody regardless of their beliefs or lifestyle. God says, no, you can't. But today what we want to talk about is this evangelism versus marketing. It's a real sad state of affairs. I, I would dare say that most, a vast majority of evangelical Christians don't even know what evangelism is nowadays. We've just been sucked in to the marketing strategy of the world. And let me show you a little bit of what I mean about that. In Wikipedia, marketing is defined in this way. Marketing is the study and management of exchange relationships. And that's the key right there. Exchange relationships. I have something you want, and you have something that I want. Let's get together and figure out how we can exchange what each other wants. Marketing is the business process of creating relationships with and satisfying customers. Churches by the thousands here in America have adopted that philosophy. We need to create relationships and satisfy our customers to keep them coming back. And in fact, we even need to grow and get more numbers. Thirdly, with its focus on the customer, now re remember this definition is coming from a secular source, but it's amazing how these tendencies are in the church today with its focus on the customer 
And so many of the churches today are preoccupied with appealing to and satisfying the body in the pew. And what, what does God want? What does God desire? Pleasing God here in our midst is, is second place at best. Sometimes it's not even in the thought process. We've just got to create ways to entertain these people, to attract them, and to keep them coming back. But in the business model, all of the focus is on the customer. How do I please the customer? In the church, the focus is supposed to be, how do we please God and Him alone? And so the churches have adopted this way of building and maintaining these exchange relationships. We see it here in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false prophets among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them. And remember when it says they're denying the master, the master is the key word in that phrase. They're denying Jesus' lordship. They refuse to surrender to his mastery. Many will follow their sensuality, and because of them, the way of truth will be blasphemed. You know, I've mentioned this before. The church in the past two to three years, probably more than that, probably five or more years, has taken such a beating after scandal, after scandal, after scandal has come to light. And a lot of it is because these churches were built and governed upon, upon worldly principles and the people at the top of the pyramid had way too much power and control with no accountability. And power really does corrupt, and absolute power even corrupts more. And so they put themselves in positions where they believed that whatever they decided and whatever they said was of God, and everybody else had to obey whether they agree or not. In fact, absolute agreement in many cases, is demanded and required. And as these scandals then start to emerge, we know what was in the Catholic Church. The, the Baptist Church had their own run, and it's still coming to light. All of the corruption, the sexual abuse, the authoritarian abuse. And as more and more of this comes to light, the way of truth, unfortunately, ends up being blasphemed because the world looks at the church and says, you bunch of hypocrites, you're no different than us. And they're right. And it's because we, have, we no longer preach a gospel of being born again where all things become new and old things pass away and you're a new creature in Christ. We no longer preach a gospel of you must repent of your sins and be washed in the blood of Jesus and be changed and transformed into the image of Jesus. And when that's no longer being preached, you have just a bunch of powerless religious people still given to their sins and addictions. And the way of truth ends up being blasphemed. But these leaders in their greed... Not just for money. They're greedy for money, all right, but they're greedy for fame. They're greedy for position. They're greedy for status. They're like the hypocrites. They're, they're like the Pharisees, Jesus said. When they walk down the hallway, they love for people to turn and say, oh, who's, you see who's that, who that is? They love all of that public worship. And so they're greedy for power, money, status, position. And when you put yourself in that position, you're going to fall hard. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. So you hear you have this exchange relationship where these false teachers are using the people to get what they want, to feed their egos, to fill their wallets. And then in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3, for the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but have itching ears they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. Now, frankly, I have a hard time even understanding why, why people would bother coming to church if church is not the church. 
But, uh, you know, I, I do run into people all the time at work, and, and they have some religious notion on the inside of them, well, you know, going to church will make me a better person, or going to church will, you know, earn brownie points with God, and he'll see that I'm interested, or it's, it's really, it's, it's a perverted uh, religious fog that they're walking in. And so they, they want to come to church because they kind of feel like they need church and it's like, like, it's the right thing to do, but their lives are never changed. But don't you dare talk about sin or repentance or hell or the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Don't even go there, preacher, because if you do, we're walking out. And so what we have is we have preachers using people and we have the people using preachers. And it's a codependent Perverted relationship. And that's the management of these exchange relationships. And people turn away from listening to the truth and they wander off into myths. I put there in your notes this, what we think of as evangelism, it's been corrupted and it has conformed to this world system of marketing. And I'll show you how here in a moment. But Romans 12 verse 2 warns us of this, doesn't it? Do not be conformed to this world. And remember that word conformed. We see the English word system. And systematically, over the years, the church has been conformed to this image of a marketing strategy. And let me show you a little bit of what this strategy is all about. Number one. And I think you'll see it there in the charts. But success is is defined by temporal and visible metrics in the world. The philosophy is this, and you will see it time and time again. Well, you know, living things grow. And if a church is not growing numerically, then it is dying or dead already. Not true. This next quote is from Ed Stetzer, and he actually writes a lot of good things. This one wasn't so good. But this came from an article that says, The Writing on the Wall, The Church is Not Growing. And he says here in this article, here are the facts. North America is the only continent in the world where the church is not growing. In North America, the church is in decline. Some even claim it is dying. This is in an article from February 4th, 2019. Most denominations, including evangelical denominations, are shrinking. And so people, they've adopted this worldly marketing model of if we're not growing, if if we don't have more people, more activities, more money, then we're dying. And so they judge the success of the church by temporal metrics which is nothing but worldly marketing. I put there in your notes, when success is defined by metrics, that is a strong compulsion to become all-inclusive. Because if success means having more money, more activity, more people, then I'm going to have to include more people And I'm going to have to do what appeals to the majority to get all these people to entice them to come. And I put their holiness and purity are too restrictive to be tolerated in this kind of a mindset. And so now you're you're erasing half of the Bible to be able to bring these people in and accept their sin. And it's all because the church has adopted and been conformed to not the biblical standard of evangelism, but the worldly standard of marketing, saying we have to have more and more and more in order to be perceived as successful. And that is what's driving the majority of the American churches. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 10, Paul is speaking, and remember in 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, it's very important to remember the context in which Paul is speaking because people are questioning his ministry. 
They're questioning him as a minister. And they're saying, you know, there are much better preachers out there than Paul. And we don't know if he's really called of God or not. And so they're questioning his authority. They're questioning the effectiveness of his ministry. And here we get a little taste of it in 2 Corinthians 10, verse 10. For they say, talking about Paul, his letters are weighty and strong, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech of no account. Remember, historians believe that they've uncovered a couple of descriptions of Paul's presence. They say that he was short, bow-legged, very bald, with a very large nose. So he probably didn't make it on the cover of a lot of magazines. (laughs) Plus, remember when he went to uh, visit the church in in Galatia, he told the Galatians later, he said, you know, when I came to you, I, I was sick and you guys had to take care of me. You know, they're probably thinking, oh, great. This guy's supposed to come and minister to us, and here we are having to take care of him. We see how many times Paul refers to the fact that he ministered from a point of weakness. He apparently, according to verse 10, if we're reading this right, he was not this strong, dynamic, charismatic presence on the stage. He just simply spoke and moved in the power of God. And a lot of times, God's vessels are not the ones that you would pick. I I think of this often, that the work that Lisa and Dana are doing there in Texas. I really feel there's going to be a day, you know, that day of judgment when a mega church and all that they've done, the wood, the hay, the stubble, will be rejected by God. And the work that Lisa and Dana have done by touching one life here and there with an uncompromised message of truth, that will be as pure gold in the sight of God. And they will have accomplished more eternally than an American megachurch that has been built on commercialism and marketing and branding. One day in the end, God will make it all right, and he will show who and what he really approves. He goes on in verse 12, and Paul says, Not that we dare to classify or compare ourselves with some of those who are commending themselves. But when they measure themselves by one another and compare themselves with one another, they don't understand. (laughs) They are judging by sight. They are judging by the appearance of things. And they don't understand that the appearance of things can be so deceiving. They're judging as a man judges on the external and not on the eternal and so we start to compare ourselves and, and uh, you know, well, that church over there, they've got that. And, you know, I, I'd really like stuff like that. I'd, I'd like to be involved over there. I liked, uh, you know, here recently in church we had those two young men that came in. Very, I think they were 18. Very respectful, very polite, very well-spoken. It seemed like very loving young men. And one of them talked to me after service, and he said, well, you know, when we first arrived and came in, I thought, this doesn't look like any church I've ever been in. But then he tried to console me a little bit by saying, but it's okay. (laughs) So I don't know exactly how to take that, but we are so used to judging by the appearance of things. And if you walk into a room like this, people look around and they think, well, this church is a failure. (laughs) Meeting in a warehouse? Look how few there are. 
if you're going to judge by the appearance, and if you're going to, like Paul says here, if you're going to measure yourself by others, if you're going to compare yourself with others, you are without understanding. Stupid would be a good interpretation. We don't judge by the flesh. We don't draw conclusions by the appearance of things. We understand that God moves mysteriously in the spirit in ways that can't be observed with the five senses. Paul goes on here, and I, I put a couple things in here just to we'll move on. Boy, that really white, it washed out, didn't it? You won't be able to see it, but I'll, I'll have to talk through it a little bit. I just wanted to show you how drawn we are to this world system and to marketing strategies in the church. This is a blog. Kim, uh, I don't know if it's Gents or Gents or how to pronounce it. She's a worship leader, much like uh, Chris Tomlin or some of these other, uh, you know, Corey Voss. There are worship leaders that just go from conference to conference and from church to church conducting worship services. You know, they, they're, they're in the venues that, where there's thousands and even tens of thousands of people. And that's how they make their living. They just travel around and conduct worship services. And, uh, and so this is her blog where other worship leaders come and comment and so forth. But the title of this blog is, Are We Staging Sex Appeal in Worship? Well, there's one worship leader here that I think is really sexy, but, uh, but that's not what he's saying. Are we staging sex appeal? In other words, do you have the look? Boy, I wish I could read some of this to you. Um, but that really washed out. But do you see the top headline? The big question... This is in this blog. Are ugly leaders allowed on stage? <laughs> and then there's content there that washed out. The conclusion is the modern church, no, not on stage. We'll let you in the back door, but stay away from the stage. <sighs> you know, I told you, I, I heard on the radio... Oh, what's that? I forget the call letters. 91.9, I think it's WTGS, which is a great station. I listen to them from time to time. I'm not criticizing the station at all. But, you know, they were doing a lead-in for a Lauren Daigle song. And the DJ was actually complimenting Lauren at how good of a job she did transitioning from the Christian artists to the secular artists. That is nothing to compliment. But I want to tell you something. You know why it was so easy for Lauren Daigle to transition from the Christian to the secular? Because the Christian, in a lot of ways, is exactly like the secular. Let me show you what I mean by this. I'm going to have to turn my back to you. This is part of her blog. Fast forward six years. I was at another event in another location across the country. After a good time of corporate worship, several people commented to the leader on almost exactly the same two points. What a great time of worship it was and how the person looked good. Person after person said almost the same precise thing. In quotes, that was a great time of worship. Man, you are looking real good these days. What struck me about this last example was how many people said the same thing and how they chose to say those two specific things. And so what has happened is in this culture of the American church, worship leaders have become a celebrity. They become their own stars on stage. And people are worshiping them many times and their music Instead of worshiping Jesus, it's become entertainment. 
It's a way they make their living. They are stars. And maybe someday, if I'm really, really good, I can cross over into the secular market. I love this one, the over 50 worship leader. I don't know why, but I could identify with this one. The over 50. And the, the comment here is really good, if I can read it to you. I'm going to go over here for a minute. We are losing a generation of worship leaders at an alarming rate. And what's happening is, you know, all of the 30, 20, 30 hipster millennials are leaving the church in droves because they want, you know, they want on stage, they want these young people with pretty faces, uh, slim and trim, and because that youth just, you know, means that this is a growing, thriving church. Look, even young people come here. And so he says, as churches bemoan the lack of qualified leaders in music, now get this, it might be time to take another look at the awesome resource we have in our seasoned servants in worship ministry. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like, baby, when you hit 50, you're out of here. But times are so desperate. We'll even talk to a 50-year-old now. It's a business. And the same principles that drive the world drive the church. And it's all about mass appeal. It's all about having the look, having the image. Oh, this was a good one too. How modern architecture, architecture influences the church experience. I was really saddened that they didn't use a picture of Westgate Chapel. But people, you know, this is a real thing. I love that picture. You see how the lawnmower, all the straight lines heading towards the church? I'm not mocking it. I'm just saying we have been so seduced. We think worship is a temporal, earthly thing instead of, instead of a spiritual, eternal thing. And people need something like this to feel like they're meeting God when they could meet God down by the river under the oak tree. And the true meaning of worship and serving God has been so completely lost, and it's because people are not taught the Word of God anymore. I loved Paul's attitude here, and this is an attitude that would be very healthy for you and me to adopt in many ways. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3. Here's Paul. Paul is being criticized. He's being second-guessed. People are saying, ah, oh, Paul's he's not a big deal. I like Apollos better. I like Cephas better. And he says here in verse 3, but with me it's a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. He's not referring to matters of sin or righteousness here. He's referring to this ongoing controversy. And basically he's saying, I don't care what you guys think. I don't care how you judge me. I don't care how you perceive me. He says, in fact, I don't even judge myself, which I think is very important. The fact that God has called us here, and I'm becoming, I'm, I'm believing more and more that people don't come to Westgate Chapel until, unless they are really called to be here because otherwise they don't stay. And it's because we don't have a lot of the earthly attractions and appeal that other churches have. It's that simple. The Word of God is not enough for people. And I'm not saying that these other churches don't teach the Word of God. I'm just saying we don't have all the bells and whistles. We are the stripped-down version. But Paul's attitude was, I don't care what you guys think of me. I don't even let my own mind go there. And so when in your own mind you're thinking and you're looking at yourself and you're thinking, who am I and I'm nothing and 
look at our church, we're nothing, and we must look like a bunch of foolish failures to everybody out there. And Verse 3, don't let your mind go there. Paul says, I don't even judge myself. He says, I'm not aware of anything that I'm doing wrong. But he says, that doesn't matter. It's the Lord who judges me. And look at what he says in verse 5. And this is why I said what I said about Lisa and Dana a moment ago. Do not pronounce judgment before the time. And there's a lot of people who would say, oh, that big church over there with all the people, all the money, all the activities, that's a successful church. Ah, you may not want to pronounce judgment before the time. Because there's a time coming when the Lord comes and he will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. And I know for a fact that there are rewards waiting in heaven for Lisa and Dana that some of these mega churches will never receive. So be careful before you judge something a success or a failure by the mere appearance or by what you think or by worldly marketing standards. Don't pronounce judgment before the time. There is a time coming where God will pronounce what he sees as successful. And it's not the worldly kind of success that's measured by metrics. We just scratched the surface and it's already time to go. We'll talk about this some more. We'll dig a little deeper into this. Because I want you to see how, you know, our definition of success affects everything. How you define success will determine your strategy to get to that success. And so if your strategy, excuse me, if your definition of success is just more and more and more, then you'll do anything to get there. And your strategy will be corrupt. But we'll talk about and get into that a little bit more next week. Father, we thank you for we thank you for the gathering here. We thank you for those that join us on Skype. And Father, we are a bunch of just sinful misfits, both in the room and on Skype. And so many times we feel as though we can't do anything right. But Father, we want to. We're sorry for our sins. We're sorry for how far we fall short. And Father, we pray that you would use us. We pray that you would dwell among us. Because Father, that's what you do. You love the sinner. You hate the evildoer but you love the repentant sinner and you're willing to work with us and you're willing to use us and you're willing to lay your favor upon us. So Father, we humbly submit to your word, to your plan, to your wisdom. We love you. We thank you. Father, keep us safe. Lord, if we're going to just believe everything that the secular says, if we're just going to believe everything that is visible or visual, if we're going to judge success by apparent results, it would be better for us to pluck our eyes out so we wouldn't even be tempted to look at that stuff. Father, teach us to see things as you see things. And you spoke to the prophet who was going to anoint the next king after Saul. And you said, don't judge by the appearance. Because the Lord judges by the heart. Father, I thank you for every heart here and on Skype. And we pray that your blessing would continue to be upon us. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.